<laughs> My name is Manjil Bhargava. Yes. Uh, I'm a mathematician at Princeton University. Okay. We guess we should start with the uh, sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, you have a uh, an honor that most mathematicians don't have. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Fields Medal? Um, it's a prize that's given every four years at the International Congress of Mathematicians, uh, up to four people every four years, because mm -hmm. uh, the Congress is held every four years. Well, what is your area, and what were the area of the other Fields Medalists? Uh, there's geometric group theory and, to, and geometry. There was uh, analysis. Then your area is? Uh, number theory. Number theory. Yeah. Now, number theory is a, a subtle area that um, people who don't do number theory, especially the public, fails to appreciate because it sounds like the easiest branch of mathematics because we all deal with integers. Right. And right. Uh, um, why do you think it is so subtle, in, which seems paradoxical to so many people? Why, why is it so subtle? It seems to be more subtle than most areas of mathematics. Yeah, it's, it's because the questions are very deceiving. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Deceivingly simple, uh, which was part of the attraction uh, uh, towards the subject for me. Okay. Is that so many of the questions are so simple to state, and yet when you try to solve them, that same level of simple thinking does not lead to their answers. Yeah. And number theory has been amazing in that it's absorbed techniques from from geometry, from topology, from group theory, from from so many different areas in order to. Uh, to tackle some of these very simple problems. It's required some very, very, as you said, subtle and, and deep techniques from a variety of fields in order to, to solve some of these questions that are just so simple to state where you don't need to know anything. Yes. And I think that's what makes it so subtle because in a lot of other subjects, even the questions are difficult to state. And then yes. when you answer them, they're about on the same level of difficulty. I mean, usually, obviously, the difficulty goes higher when you go, go to answer them. But for number theory, that's, that difference is especially marked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are at G4G, and uh, uh, we are based on the sense of finding the intersection between mathematics and recreation and arts and everything else. Um, where, where was your first, who was the first time you noticed mathematics impacting the outside world? And where, well, it's everywhere you can see, of course, but where were you first drawn to? Well, in the beginning, it was just my personal experiences. I would, uh, I loved making games by myself and then trying to play with them. I, I always tell the story of how I used to like to stack oranges and pyramids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was seven or eight years old, I'd take all the family oranges that were meant for the juicer and I'd make <laughs> pyramid structures. Uh, and I wanted to know if you take a triangular pyramid of oranges and you have this many oranges on each side, how many total oranges do you need in order to, uh, to make the whole pyramid? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, that was the first math problem that I really was excited about uh, okay. early on. And ha when I finally solved it, which took weeks, I think, uh, I found the answer that if you have n oranges on each side, the total number of oranges you need for the pyramid is n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 divided by 6. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing revelation for me that of how, of the predictive power of mathematics, that you can, you can just put in the number n into this formula and it'll tell you how many oranges you need. And that was like a, that seemed like a direct connection to the real world where you have this abstract formula and it tells you, boom, this is how many oranges you need. And then you can actually build that pyramid with that many oranges and it, and it just works out perfectly. And it was number theory. Yeah. And it was number theory, yeah. <laughs> you gave a talk about the uh, ramifications of some number theory results, some corollaries from that that lead to the principle behind a lot of magic tricks. Hmm. Um, did you have... What order did that come in? Did you know about the magic first and the applications thereof, or, or were you just sort of going back in the literature? Uh, no, I learned about the magic first. Uh, I first, uh, I mean, in, as far as my talk goes, I was talking about numbers such as 142857, which yes. have this amazing property that you take its first few multiples and you just get the same digits back. Right. Uh, when, you, when you take the first six multiples of 142857, you just get cyclic permutations of the same number. Uh, yeah, I learned that as a child. Uh, I don't remember where I first learned it, but I do remember eventually hitting a Martin Gardner article about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found this number absolutely magical, and yes. of course it has many magical applications in the sense that it's 
magicians actually use this number. Uh, but I didn't know the full mathematics behind it, but I was always wondered, uh, mm -hmm. what is it that made that number tick <laughs> that, the way it does? Uh, and then as I learned more number theory, of course, uh, those ingredients started to fall into place. And then are there infinitely many such numbers that have that property? Uh, those are things that started coming when you start taking graduate courses in number theory, you start making those connections. Uh, but those deep results in number theory, they're often not presented with that recreational uh, application in mind. And I think it should be, because it, it certainly excited me a lot to be able to make those connections. And it made those abstract results more concrete and connected to something that I could understand as a child and had deep implications for those simple questions that I had as a child, even though they're very deep results and conjectures in number theory that they actually connect to and that you can only really understand uh, when you're in graduate school. Now, we also know, because we've seen the title of your talk, that you find some connections with music and, uh, and, and drumming and rhythms. Yeah. Um, do you want to remark upon that? Right. Well, it's, uh, one of the things I was going to talk about tomorrow is, is the fact that many of the fundamental mathematical structures that we, we talk about, such as binomial coefficients or Fibonacci numbers or uh, memory wheels, they, all, they sort of they arose in history uh, for the first time by artists and poets thinking about their subject as an art. Mm -hmm. And these mathematical consequences just came. And we don't uh, really know, even in India. So I'm going to talk about some of the Indian instances of this happening. Yes. Because I grew up in uh, this Indian musical tradition. My family had lots of Indian musicians. And, so, and my grandfather was a Sanskrit scholar. So I was lucky to uh, have grown up in, in this tradition and, and got to learn some of these, uh, sort of these ancient works of literature that were mainly poet, poetry and music related. And yet, they're writing about these mathematical objects. And even in India, the mathematicians are unaware of this. It's only the poets and the musicians who know about this. But in fact, in history, uh, Fibonacci numbers were first discovered by poets mm -hmm. uh, you know, a thousand years before Fibonacci. Uh, binomial coefficients were discovered you know, a thousand years before Pascal. <laughs> um, yes. And so the, uh, it really illustrates the fine line between art and mathematics. Uh, in ancient times, people didn't really separate them the way we do now. Now there is a, a sort of a folk theorem or folklore that the best computer scientists are musicians. Or a lot of them are concert pianists like Scott Kim. Right, right. In India, is there a correlation between mathematical aptitude and uh, this drumming? Mm, yeah, I, th I think there is. And I think that's a worldwide thing. I think that good scientists, good mathematicians, good computer scientists, it's so common that they, they play an instrument or they paint or they do some kind of art. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty common to see. Uh, but I noticed that the, you know, the best mathematicians and scientists, you take a look at, you know, and you see that art is a, is a huge part of their lives, and music and drumming, a huge part of their lives. There's something about developing both sides of the brain, the artistic side of the brain, in order to be creative, even in science. Mm -hmm. And I definitely feel that in my uh, in my own world, that you know, if I spend enough time on art, then I'm more creative also when I think about mathematics. <laughs> um, so are there any other relationships that perhaps that you've learned here from G4G um, that you will want to explore when you get back? It's information overload. <laughs> I see. My brain is full, but there's certainly lots of things that have stimulated uh, the mind for me <laughs> in the past few days. Uh, I love that so many people are interested in mathematics and art here at G4G, in addition to mathematics and magic, of course, which uh, is another one of my interests. Uh, Gardner had a long, lifelong interest in magic. Yeah, of course. First well, published in 1930, and he last published in 2010. What I, how I got interested in that. I mean, I never practiced magic so much growing up, but I loved reading Martin Gardner and things that he recommended to read, sort of as a, just the theoretical problem solving of magic mm -hmm. is something that I really I really enjoyed, and I learned a lot of that from Martin Gardner. Uh, so we, uh, we're happy that you're here, <laughs> no, and uh, continued success, and thank you for coming. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's Bye -bye. been a great pleasure. Thank you.